Hey, what's up? Um, I am out on a hike at the amphitheater today. I went on a pretty good run w with uh, Solange yesterday. Legs are a little sore. Um, if you don't know who Solange is, this is Solange. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you look in her eyes, you might uh, guess what that was like. It was, uh, yeah, kind of like this. Our discussion is going to be about today is about enzymes. So a lot of enzymes were used yesterday. Yeah, and even if we talk about just glycolysis, which is one of the steps of cellular respiration, and trust me, a lot of cellular respiration went on yesterday. Um, there are whatever, like 10, 10 steps in glycolysis alone. And um, one thing you're going to learn about enzymes, or one thing we'll talk about enzymes, is that enzymes are very specific. So, so for each one of those 10 steps in glycolysis, each step has its own specific enzyme. So if we, if you think about it, like, and um, that run yesterday lasted, whatever, 45 minutes. So if you think about it, that's a, that's a lot of enzymes being produced, abused and used for sure. So we're going to take a little easy hike here down at the amphitheater and uh, get the legs rolling again and maybe get, up, get back for a run later. Hey, let's, um, let's think back to over the past couple units. Those past units, we talked about carbohydrates and lipids and proteins and nucleic acids. It was really easy to think about the monomers and polymers in carbohydrates because the monomers were the simple sugars and the polymers were the complex carbohydrates like starch and cellulose. It's easy to think about the um, monomers and polymers in proteins because the monomers are amino acids and the polymers are the polypeptides. It was really easy to think about the um, the monomers and polymers of nucleic acids because the monomers are um, nucleotides and the nucleic acids themselves are the polymers. Lipids were a little bit harder to understand or harder to think about the monomer polymer dichotomy with those because they're amphiphilic, right? So they have a hydrophobic part and a hydrophilic part and each part has its own kind of monomers and polymers. So the, the hydrophobic tails had the hydrocarbon monomers and um, then the carboxyl head group and all that kind of stuff. So those are all kind of put together. Today, we'll specifically talk about a specific group of proteins called enzymes. And enzymes, all enzymes are proteins. And um, therefore, they're made up of amino acids as their monomer. And then the polypeptide is the polymer. But amino acids do have like very specific jobs in our body. And um, kind of an overarching way to say, to talk about all of enzymes um, together like as a group is that they their job is to lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction so when they lower this um, the activation energy of the chemical reaction what they do is they actually speed up the reaction so um, some reactions won't take place without them um, some reactions will take just a long time without them but their their job is to um, lower that activation energy and then speed that up. So all things that actually speed up a chemical reaction are called catalysts. So each enzyme, usually very specific, will, will catalyze a specific chemical reaction. So I just dawned on me, you may not actually um, understand or know what I mean by activation energy. Um, activation energy is, um, I guess you can think of it like an investment. So activation energy means that you have to put a little energy into a chemical reaction to make the whole reaction happen. So um, if with an enzyme specifically, if we lower the activation energy of a reaction, what it can do is actually break, break things apart or put things together. And so then we get the product out of it. Solange brought this up the other day that um, it's like, we were talking about changing habits and like, how do we change habits? And um, if you, let's say this, we talk about flossing. You need to floss more, right? So if you need to floss your, floss your teeth, one thing that you can do to change that habit is to like set a goal and change, you know, like make sure, put a schedule and make sure you're gonna floss. That's one way to do it. Um, 
actually maybe the more effective way to do it is to just make flossing easier. So uh, what we did is got like a set of uh, like those flossers, like those little toothpick flossers and put them in a jar on the bathroom sink. So it's, uh, you know, it's just easier to grab one of those flossers and just get the job done versus like taking the time to like pull out the string and get in there and do all that kind of stuff. You can kind of think of enzymes as that. What they do is they, they make it easier. They just make that chemical reaction easier. So you remember that sugars had a very indicative suffix, um, O-S-E, right? Like glucose, fructose, um, sucrose, lactose. Um, all of those indicated that we we're talking about a sugar. Enzymes also have like a, a suffix like that that you can identify them with or we use to name enzymes with and see if, uh, see if you can come up with that as we kind of go through this. Hey, um, speaking of lactose. So I've already mentioned this a couple times. I'm gonna guess do it again. Um, so you remember that the protein monomers are amino acids and they're put together um, in a polypeptide chain. So if we put together the wrong monomers or if the wrong monomers are in there and we try to put it together, it doesn't get put together right. And if it doesn't get put, put together right, it's broken. So this is another way that we can think about and one of the things we talked about with carbs and lipids specifically, um, well, probably also, also with proteins and nucleic acids, is that form equals function. <clears throat> so like we had talked about that with form equals function, with enzymes catalyze very specific chemical reactions. Um, and they also, and maybe this is like obvious to you, but they also only function in very specific environments. So you could understand amylase, which is an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates, breaks down the carbohydrate polymer into the monomer glucose, or the monomers of glucose. And that starts in, your, in the saliva in your mouth as you're chewing your food. And this is one of the reasons that you really need to chew your, chew your food very well. Um, is it actually digestion starts in your saliva? But you could probably figure out that the environment in your mouth is very different than in your stomach. Your stomach has much more is a much more acidic environment. So when you swallow the carbohydrates and the amylase along with it, the amylase breaks down or stops functioning when it gets to your stomach, mixing with all of the acid in your stomach. <clears throat> This is called denaturation. So you can denature proteins, you can take them apart with acid, right? So you take them apart, they, that's why they stop working, because you actually take them apart. You could also denature proteins um, or enzymes, which are a type of protein, with heat. Um, the egg albumin, right, egg whites, that's not an enzyme, but it is a protein. And the same thing would happen to an enzyme if you heated it up that it's gonna come apart. And that's why the eggs turn white is because the protein and the, the albumin protein comes apart and you can't see through it anymore. All of the metabolic pathways in our body, I mean, they're super complex. There's just a lot of them. And each one of them, um, and a lot of them have associated enzymes with those metabolic processes, either putting together anabolic or taking apart catabolic. Um, all of these metabolic processes <clears throat> have associated enzymes with them or may have associated enzymes with them. So all those thousands of enzymes working in our body have this kind of general overarching function of like, well, overarching kind of idea of like form equals function. And um, <clears throat> we, ha we can use that to solve problems for us and um, actually create some problems for other things. So this is a picture of my dad. He was uh, just recently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, if you don't know what Parkinson's disease is, it's a <clears throat> it's a like a degenerative disease in which that uh, your brain stops 
producing very much dopamine. Dopamine's a neurotransmitter. So they want to, like one of the targets, there's not, not a lot of medicine out there for it. It's because um, they can't really figure out there's no cure. We can just slow down the process of it or slow down the, the thing. And that's actually how they <clears throat> diagnosed him. It, it is a degenerative disease. So the first time he went to the neurologist, you couldn't, they couldn't say he has Parkinson's disease. They said, okay, he has Parkinson-like um, conditions or symptoms. But it wasn't until the second time he went back to the neurologist and they saw that it got worse that um, <clears throat> they were actually able to say, okay, he has Parkinson's disease and prescribe him medication for it. Now, there are very few medications for Parkinson's disease that, I, that I'm aware of. Um, <clears throat> and what they all do is target um, specific enzymes in the process. So some of the things that can happen with Parkinson's disease is that dopamine can be, like do dopamine's not made, okay? That's what Parkinson's disease, what's happening with Parkinson's disease. So we can solve the concentration of dopamine by either not letting the enzymes break it down that normally do, <clears throat> or trick it to produce more, or provide the, provide the um, substrates to produce more dopamine. There's a specific medicine called selegiline, I think is what it, how you pronounce it, um, that works to act as a competitive inhibitor on MAO, monoamine oxidase. So what it does is it actually binds into the MAO enzyme's active site where dopamine would bind. So dopamine would typically bind into um, dopamine would typically bind into that active site but it can't get in there because selegiline is in there, right? So <clears throat> that is a competitive inhibitor. So I guess if I can be a little clearer about this, a competitive inhibitor is a molecule that binds to the enzyme at the active site where the typical substrate or the um, intended substrate would bind. There's another type of way that enzymes can be turned on and off, and this is with non-competitive inhibition. Um, and you know this one, this is the one I was saying um, causes problems for other things like pests, like bacteria, the bacteria that make us sick. So um, the first antibiotic was penicillin, which I guess penicillin is not super effective anymore because of um, antibiotic resistance, but here's how it initially worked. It was a non-competitive inhibitor. What it did was it bound to the enzyme in these um, specific type of bacteria that made us sick um, and it prevented the enzyme that was one of the last steps in making the bacterial cell wall. So what happened was that once these, the bacteria couldn't make their cell wall, they kept filling up with water and they would explode. And so if you can take penicillin and it's effective still for you, that's what's happening. So the bacteria, um, the bacteria that's making you sick can't build their cell, cell wall if you take penicillin. The penicillin binds on the um, enzyme, but not at the active site. So just to kind of give a clear idea here of, of what non-competitive inhib inhibition is. So like, <clears throat> The, with penicillin, it binds on the enzyme, but not at the active site. It's gonna bind someplace else on the enzyme and then change the shape of the enzyme, making the active site not accessible. So this is non-competitive inhibition because it's not competing for the same active site. All right, so this kind of brings up or wraps up our um, discussion on enzymes, except I got a couple other questions for you. So if we had the fixed amount of enzyme and then we changed the substrate. We changed the substrate concentration. We like moved it down, made it so there was less substrate, or we moved it up so we made it so there was more substrate. Do you think the, the reaction rate or the rate that the products were formed would increase or decrease? What if we kept the substrate concentration the same, but we changed the enzyme concentration? We increased the concentration of enzyme or decreased the concentration of enzyme. What do you think would happen? Um, so really, that's gonna be two very important questions that you will need to know the answer to. We will address those in the RCT and the collab this week. All right, guys, um, oh, battery's about dead, perfect timing. 
Hey, we'll see you later.